Hi everyone, I'm Christy. I'm Edzia. And we're doing the qualitative election study of 2015. This is our post-Cardiff, or sorry, our Cardiff post-focus uh, group vlog, where we're going to tell you how our first two main focus groups went in Cardiff, and a little bit about where we're going uh, after this. So maybe I can just start to say that, you know, we've done the two leaders debates, and this time we were doing the uh, actually the main study. So for the first time we had only focus group collection, no television involved, and we had to really finalize and tweak our questions. So we spent the week, we had a general idea of what we wanted theoretically to investigate, but we wanted time for our advisory board members to give us some feedback and comments. So we got all of that organized since the last focus group and then conducted it. So, do you want to talk a little bit, Adzia, about the final recruitment and the numbers? Yeah. Um, so, we initially planned for 14 participants um, in uh, in total for the two focus groups, so eight in one and six in the other. Um, and our recruitment strategy was to get at two constituencies, so Cardiff Central and Cardiff North, because of the uh, dynamics of uh, marginality versus safe. So one of those was a marginal constituency and the other was an open seat. Um, and so we thought that given the location of the university and given the population and the constituency, those two choices would be good for us. Uh, so we did end up getting quite a good um, number of people who applied. I think it was close to about 100 in the end, yeah, right? Yeah, close to 100, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we had a good pool to choose from. Uh, we got the eight for the first focus group, which was a mix of four central and four north, and then uh, six for the second, um, which was four central and two north. Uh, we couldn't go to the complete eight because we didn't want to just pack it up with students because the majority of our applicants were students. Um, yeah, so that's how the recruitment kind of panned out. Uh, in terms of on the day, um, we got a couple of dropouts which we could then replace quite quickly. But then on the day we had three people not show up for the second focus group at all. All students? Um, at least two were students. Yeah. Um, the first focus group went off without a hitch. Um, uh, well, it didn't go off without a hitch, but in terms of recruitment, it did. <laughs> um, there, were, all the eight participants turned up. It was really good discussion. Um, and then for the second one, we had just three participants. It was still a very good discussion, very much in depth. The participants who did turn up actually got a chance to really talk about their um, decision-making processes and their opinions and so on. So in terms of the data, actually, it wasn't affected at all. Uh, at least that's what we think. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing that we tried for the first time, because we had, we couldn't get all of the Cardiff Central people in one group and all the Cardiff North people in a different time group. So we ended up mixing them up together. So one of the things that we tried this time was dual moderators. And that way, the idea was if we had in, in both groups, you know, people from Central and North, that I would take Central and Zia would take North. And then we kind of pay a bit more attention to the discussions of the people in those constituencies in order to remember what they said and bring up questions and doing probing based on their particular dynamics. And we ended up kind of not only doing that section moderated but going back and forth for the whole group and I generally it worked I think really well the only thing was uh, kind of forgetting who I for occasionally toward the end would forget that it was your turn or forget <laughs> that it was my turn but um, by then that was also the second focus group mm. and it was like the last 20 minutes mm. but I felt that that generally went really well it was also on the moderator a lot less exhausting mm. so we were both a bit tired after mm. the first group but I don't think you were nearly as tired as the previous yeah as the previous night yeah. and that also allowed um, one one person was moderating the other person to watch people mm. and uh, just to sort of point out oh someone on this mm. side has still had a point on the last questions mm. before you move on just to make sure that we are capturing all the data mm. I don't know that we're gonna do that in every single one mm. but we wanted to at least try it to see how it would work out whether or not it was something that would we want to put in mm. our toolkit as mm. options and I think that if it if it theoretically called for it again, you know, if we had other mixed groups for whatever reason, maybe in the post, mm. Labour vers voters versus Conservative voters or mm. something, we would be willing to do it again. Mm. Yeah, I agree. I think the the point that you made when we were walking back was that the dual moderator works well when it's a contentious topic, mm. and uh, we didn't have as much of disagreement. 
-hmm. it seemed like in the groups that we conducted so in the future if we do end up in a situation where uh, we expect polarized uh, gro or groups with two polarizing views viewpoints um, then we might want to try that again yeah and I think we'd feel more confident mm. doing that um, with a more t contentious group having done it and it's very successfully with a less contentious group yeah so great. yeah in terms of big findings maybe we could I mean sum up a little bit about uh, different aspects of the group that m people might find interesting in terms of reactions mm -hmm. so, so what was a big finding? I think for us, the policy, the, uh, the with the debates, the big finding was that people wanted more policy specifics. Mm -hmm. um, in the in the in what the leaders were saying, they they felt that a lot of the times leaders were just saying platitudes, mm -hmm. uh, and they didn't really learn much when it was just platitudes. But when they kind of went into the policy specifics, they did quite uh, really like that. Right. I mean, Nicola's comment on Trident and making choices between conventional and nuclear weapons her rationale some people didn't agree with but at least they felt like they knew where she was coming from and she they knew where she stood mm -hmm. and she'd actually given an all a policy based argument and it does what of course we're dealing with people who are technically or reporting that they're undecided or at least open to voting for more parties and when they're doing that they're using the debates to gather information mm. and some people they're, they're saying I'm learning a lot about the person and how they handle themselves under pressure how they perform in stressful situations but what it, it is a, a very serious theme that's coming across in these debates that there's not enough policy discussion that is more about these back and forth about the platitudes and that people would like to see more details they would like to for people who don't know how they're gonna vote hearing parties lay out very clear policy choices is exactly what they're going to be using to base their vote choice on because mm -hmm. they're looking for information and they're policy shopping they're not party shopping mm. they're not leader shopping they're policy shopping mm. and if you don't articulate clearly what your policies are then they can't buy you mm. know your product with their vote mm -hmm. so even you know one of the people in the groups said that they really wish Nicola Sturgeon would have been a leader of a different party mm. because they would have been willing to vote for her if she wasn't an S&P and they were, you know, mm. here in Wales. Mm. And it does, I think it does speak to the thirst for actual substance. Mm. No, not platitudes and not um, vague comments and what this government did beforehand. It's like, what are you going to do about the problems now? How do you get us out of the mess? And another person um, in our group, a, a student, um, he mentioned that while Cameron keeps banging on about the deficit and reducing the deficit, he doesn't connect that to why that's important for the economy and how that's going to help people in their real lives. How is that going to help me get a job? How is that going to help me get a better paying job? How is that going to help me afford college just to reduce the deficit? And maybe it won't, but, you know, there doesn't just, you know, the, the reducing the deficit seems to be, at least in the discourse that they're hearing, a good thing just in itself. And they're saying, I don't get it. You'll have to explain to me why we need this and that's more important than, say, you know, funding, reworking the tuition structures at universities so that people aren't borrowing thousands and thousands in order to get access to the job market where they can get a good job. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, um, we also asked them in terms of who uh, who benefited uh, from the debates, mm -hmm. and Nicola Sturgeon again came. Yeah. Uh, almost unanimously was considered to have benefited and it seems to be quite obvious but I think uh, looking at it uh, getting that kind of information from different regions you would expect that from Scotland mm -hmm. but then we got that from uh, many of our Welsh participants as well or participants in, well, in mm -hmm. Wales yeah. um, that Nicola Sturgeon definitely benefited um, and again there was unanimity that uh, Nigel Farage was talking to his base and he was mm -hmm. just trying to shore up his base so in fact, the debates matter to the extent that he could shore up his base because he wasn't really talking to everyone in the room. Yeah, there was yeah, very much that sense. And I'm trying to think anything else in terms of um, things that we want to bring out from the group itself. That debates are a good thing. Yeah. That they should go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, uh, both groups, again, independently yeah. came to the conclusion. I think one person out of the entire thing said we could do away with them and it wouldn't be missed. But he was a very much a minority. A minority, voice. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of um, awareness that it is photoshopped in a way, kind of stage managed. Mm -hmm. um, that they, um, a few participants said, "Oh yeah, we know that they get coaching and that they are trying to present themselves in a particular way." But despite all of the me what they called media hype or media bias or whatever, 
um, they still felt that the debates should go ahead mm -hmm. in our first group especially there was definitely consensus that people were learning things that it was an easier way of getting to know what the policies were mm -hmm. um, especially when people didn't have time to crawl through manifestos mm -hmm. yeah. right yeah I think the, the lack of actually sort of just speaking to the manifestos themselves was listed as a problem you know from from one person at least and um, yeah and, and our student again said um, like the Trident comment was not even an issue he was aware of and he was watching the debates with a bunch of friends and they ended up after the debates having a whole discussion about the merits of spending that kind of money on Trident versus conventional weapons and now he feels like he knows the topic a lot better as a consequence so yeah um, yeah um, trying to think of anything else that we don't want to give away too much. Yeah, yeah, yes. But I think the debates thing is important because yeah. um, we're getting people's real reactions to them and they do have a positive assessment and they think that they're important uh, going forward. So even when people, this is it, even when people talk very negatively, they mention, um, some t talk, compare it to the presidential debates in the US and make the dif distinction that we're not a president, the UK is party based. It's not personality based and that you're voting for a party, not a leader. Um, and they criticize the stage handling that despite all this negative discussion that you hear about it at the end of the day they do value the debates so don't let all of the criticisms of the debates and their formats make you think that people don't want want to get rid of them mm -hmm. i think that what they i think what the bbc and the other broadcasters mm -hmm. could negotiate for better in future are policy based debates rather than topic based debates mm -hmm. if you have specific issues that you want to address and having really deeper discussions about how do you solve this problem mm. I think that trying that out maybe you'd mm. actually get more of a response more of a uh, mm. a better um, reaction from people if you stop focusing on personalities mm. yeah yeah so that's it yeah I think we had really amazing great data especially on we have a question on which parties would you consider voting for mm -hmm. and we're getting some really interesting results on that mm -hmm. which and is thanks to our advisory board member for suggesting that mm -hmm. yeah because the the quality of the data the depth of the data is brilliant mm -hmm. yeah. really brilliant we went uh, in into people's discussions about uh, devolution and how they make choices about parties at different levels of governance and it was interesting we had one of our student assistants saying that uh, she had never heard of someone who would admit that they would vote for the conservatives mm -hmm. <laughs> in Wales but we had two participants mm -hmm. say uh, well I wouldn't consider voting conservative at the national level but I would consider voting for it at the assembly level because and then they gave their reasons so we're starting to unpack that qualitatively how people make their calculations depending on the level of government and what is important, what considerations are, are in at that point. So that was, um, we're really excited about that data. Mm -hmm. And now it's um, Birmingham? Now it's Birmingham, we're back to Dundee today mm -hmm. and then in a week's time we will be leaving for Birmingham um, and then the Colchester leg. Yes, as yes, well. As yeah. well, yeah. So I guess we'll probably have a few days off while we scurry around. Off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. First day off from blogging uh, in order to, to get everything ready for Birmingham. And chances are we'll probably do another vlog to update you guys on how the Birmingham recruitment went. Yeah. And uh, also how the how the Essex recruitment is going. We are going to go into Clacton this time. So and that's a little bit out of our scope of university reach. So we're going to have to come up with some novel and original ways to recruit people uh, in that area. Mm -hmm. But that's, a, I'm sure, a, a solution we can we can come up with. Anything else from? No, that's it. All right. So from the um, from leaving Cardiff, I'm Christy and Edzia. And we'll see you guys uh, um, right before the Birmingham focus groups. So, bye. Bye. <laughs>